Uh, thank you for joining us in this panel about uh, domestic violence. We'll have two speakers today in this panel. And uh, our first speaker is uh, Grace McGrath, who is a graduate student at Marymount University in the MA in Forensic and Legal Psychology program. Uh, she's a graduate of university at Albany, Sunny, with an undergraduate degree in business administration. Her research interests are in equity, social justice, and social change. I will now give the floor to uh, Grace McGrath. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today, we're going to talk about domestic violence and how it's a serious criminal justice and challenging public health problem and how it really affects us all. So to start off, we're going to go over the table of contents sort of for today so you sort of know how it's going to continue. So we're going to start with our introduction. We're going to discuss how COVID-19 plays a really big role with this topic and go over data across the world and how it relates to domestic violence in general. Then we're going to discuss the main portion of the presentation, including the problem statement of our paper, the context from lit literature, so what we're seeing other research providing, and then we're going to discuss healthcare practitioner barriers to screening, so what they're noticing, what we can do to improve there, and then we're going to discuss domestic violence assessment and gaps that we see in the research. Then we're going to conclude with our screening suggestions, how to do inquiry and response. We discuss confidentiality and documentation and how those are rather important. So to start off, both women and men are affected by domestic violence. So it's not, a, it's not as gendered as it may seem, and the numbers really do show that everyone is affected. So this is not something that is specific to women or specific to certain groups of people. It's specific to everybody who may be in a relationship that one person chooses to be violent in. Healthcare plays a very big role within this because oftentimes people will go to the hospital, they'll go to the emergency room with bruises and things. And often that may be dismissed by the healthcare practitioners and not notice that it may be from domestic violence and people may be not inclined to speak up about it. So healthcare plays a really big role in noticing these things. And the relationship between a patient and their doctor is a really important relationship. And oftentimes people really respect what comes from their doctors. So it's very important that we discuss this today and we improve the assistance we have within healthcare to do so. But also another goal of this paper is to add to the dialogue. So we are trying to provide some more clarity on some things, but really we're part of the larger discussion around this topic and hoping that it adds value to the conversation. So I'm sure I don't have to tell you that COVID-19 was a hard time. It was a hard time for everybody in the United States and it's still going on. People are still dying from it. And it really has affected all of us, but it really was particularly harmful to people in domestic violence situations with uncertainty, not knowing what the future held, not knowing if they could leave their home, where was a safe place to go that caused a lot of concern. A lot of support services had to close down because people couldn't go anywhere. We had lockdowns and people were ended up getting really hurt and not knowing what to do. So this increased a lot of domestic violence incidents because people weren't able to leave and go to safety because of that. So we're gonna start off with some data across the world here. So in Australia, when orders to stay home were happening, a 5% increase in domestic violence calls happened and Google reported there was a 75% increase in searches regarding domestic violence. I know there was a lot across social media about warning signs you can see if someone's in a domestic violent relationship. So there's a lot of that going on. In China, the Wuhan province saw domestic abuse case increase threefold in February of 2020 compared to the previous year. So this sort of shows that when people are cooped up, things happened that weren't great because people couldn't escape the situations they, they were in. This wasn't exclusive to the US. The American Journal of Emergency Medicine reported that there was an increase in cases of domestic violence globally from 25% to 33% in 2020. So this just shows globally that this was an issue and it's not exclusive to any particular area. And this is just rather concerning data to see. And I think a lot of people realized in the pandemic and especially when they were home, that they were actually in a, a, a domestically violent relationship that maybe they couldn't see before. So it also could account for 
the increases that we saw happen here. So our problem statement. So the general problem is the need to understand domestic violence is a serious public health and social psychology issue. So domestic violence, not that it's not taken seriously, but it's not really understood as a public health issue. People don't sort of see it that way. It's more, it's an abuse issue or it's a power issue. It really is a public health issue because it has really long-term significant impacts to health as we'll talk about later in the presentation. So people really do suffer for all, the rest of their life when they deal with domestic violence situations. The specific problem in this paper is to explore the best practices of screening approaches for victims to seek treatment in urgent care facilities, hospital emergency rooms, and the primary care physicians. And this is just important to sort of focus on the people that are on the front line. So a lot of urgent care facilities and emergency rooms are there when people maybe have a broken arm that isn't great to, that they can't really explain away. So they're really on the front lines of all of that. So it's important to educate people on what to see, what to do, and to make sure their patients are safe. The gap in the literature is that there's, a, that there's limited research on this topic since the increase of domestic violence occurrences since the onset of COVID-19, where the onset of work from home and home-related quarantine started. So there isn't a lot of research in this area, so especially since COVID started, because it was hard to do, because people weren't going to shelters or speaking up because they were maybe afraid or couldn't call people when they were in trouble. So we're gonna now go on to the context from literature. So there's a lot of great literature about domestic violence in general. So we're gonna start off with Finley. So this was, this was published in 2020. So they stated that domestic violence is associated with negative psychological consequences such as post-traumatic stress and disorder and depression. So people offer suffer, suffer with a lot of mental health issues after being in a domestic violence relationship because they weren't safe and they had to protect themselves some way so that mind had to learn to cope with that really unfortunate situation that happened. So a lot of people deal with trauma many years after being in a relationship like that. And the Houston article published in 2015, they outlined that psychological intimate partner violence also leads to physical health and mental health problems too. So on top of PTSD, you could have an arm break that never heals properly, and then you permanently have that issue for the rest of your life. So it's not just a mental game, it's a physical game, and a lot of people suffer in both ways because they can't get the treatment that they deserve. A Fowler and uh, Nicolin in 2014 noted that there is a plethora of amount of research information available about domestic violence, but minimum data exists on barriers to screen. So there's a lot of data on the amount of people abused, where the abuse is happening, but not a lot on how people are getting screened for it. So that sort of shows a gap in literature, especially within healthcare, where that screening isn't necessarily taking place and it's important that it does happen that way. All right, so now we're gonna just touch on the National Domestic Violence Hotline. So this is a very important uh, hotline in the US and let's see. And they help a lot of people that are in trouble because of domestic violence. So there, this is some data that they have. Approximately one in three women and one in 10 men, 18 years of age or older, experience domestic violence. This is a really high number. And in many cases, it may be higher than these numbers predict because some people might not know that they're in a domestic violent relationship. Annually, domestic violence is responsible for over 15,000 deaths in the United States. That's pretty high and it's probably higher in, in cases where maybe it's not known or people aren't believed they're in that type of relationship. Domestic violence victims typically experience severe physical injuries requiring care at a hospital or a clinic. And sometimes they might not be able to even go to these places because of healthcare issues. So that's another big barrier to people getting that treatment and sort of relates back to the context from literature about uh, those physical health challenges people have the rest of their life. The national annual cost of medical and mental health care services related to acute domestic violence is estimated at over $8 billion. And that's very high and it's not great for the people in it and it's not great for our system. So we need to find ways to better help people. So this doesn't have to happen. It doesn't have to, they don't have to have these services because of the situations they're in. 
At least 5 million acts of domestic violence occur annually to women aged 18 years and older. So people are experiencing this rather young and it continues as they grow old, especially if you're already in a relationship that's violent, it's very likely you may get one in the future, may, may get into one in the future. So it's sort of a cycle that tends to continue, unfortunately. Now, the CDC has some important data on this as well. In the United States, one out of 10 women in her life suffer from abuse by an intimate partner. And it's probably more, as I stated earlier, because people might not know that they did suffer abuse because there's a sort of misunderstanding about what abuse is, especially as it relates to emotional abuse. 16.9% of women would experience some violence at one point in their lifespan. And this is one reason why medical professionals are looking for ways to assist with the abuse. So it's important that we have those people at the start that are like, hey, that's not okay what's happening to you. So it doesn't continue on. So maybe they're shoved and they sort of tell their doctor that information. Their doctor can sort of state to them, hey, that's not okay. So it doesn't get to the point where maybe they're being pushed down the stairs. So it's important that we're working early on sort of ending those cycles of abuse. Nearly 40 million women experience some form of verbal, physical, or psychological abuse by their significant other or partner. So that's a large percentage of women, and it's probably more with, uh, with COVID going on, with people being forced to be at home and not being able to go to their safe places to escape that abuse. So some more context from the literature. Moreno uh, published in 2013, said the related service costs for domestic violence in the United States is between three and five billion annually. And this is gonna definitely grow with people coming out of COVID and going to get treatment for the services, for getting, the, getting treatment for what they need done. So that's only gonna grow and continue if we don't address domestic violence in an effective way at the front lines. Moyer in 2013 published that improving screening for domestic violence procedures may therefore save lives and reduce the financial burden on the United States taxpayers. So at the end of the day, we are paying for these procedures and stuff getting done for people. And it's important that we look out for our fellow people in that way, but at the same time, that is a burden that we could adjust by having better education and treatment for those who see these people every day. And the CURST in 2012 published that recognizing domestic violence abuse may lower the annual uh, judicial cost society spends yearly on domestic violence cases. So if people know early on the signs of domestic violence and stuff, that stuff that's happening to them isn't okay, it may limit the amount of cases going to court because they're not getting to the point where people are almost dying from things or they feel like their life is being threatened. They're catching it before it gets there. So there's some more context from literature. So Carol and Meyer in 2011 found that the attentiveness of healthcare practitioners in the healthcare environment is essential in evaluating and focusing on immediate care for pain and injuries. So it's important that we have compassionate care by our healthcare providers and that they're listening to people, especially regarding sensitive topics like domestic violence. In 2014, Chen Black uh, did a research on healthcare practitioners and how healthcare, healthcare practitioners and organizations need to attempt to decrease the harm to victims under existing reporting laws. So a lot of people don't take action with domestic violence cases because they're very afraid of the outcomes of it and it will make the abuse worse. So they sort of presented in this research how it's important to look at those reporting laws and if they're doing more harm than good, in some cases, because people may be afraid to tell their doctor, hey, I'm being abused because what if their partner finds out and the abuse only gets worse. In 2014, uh, Turbanak and Pat uh, promote, uh, did research on advocacy and how advocates who support the victim's liberation believed that having knowledge about domestic violence assisted with their decisions regarding safety plans so you can't have people who are ignorant of domestic violence doing domestic violence work. And this is very important to know. Direct service is crucial in this type of environment and you have to be knowledgeable and compassionate with it. So you just can't be assuming that you know it all. And Moreno in 2013 found 
that there was no assurance that law enforcement would improve women's safety. So a lot of times people are just afraid of law enforcement, especially in today's day and age where a lot of people are more likely to be harmed by law enforcement. So it's important that we have uh, positions in place through things that people trust, like their doctor or nurses, and have those support systems that people can count on. So now we're going to talk about healthcare practitioners barriers to screening for domestic violence. So routines, rich, routine screening for circumstances related to domestic violence screening occurred at a rate equivalent to or less than customary domestic violence. So there isn't routine screening in place, really. I know I haven't seen it happen. I mean, when I've gone to hospital, I was never asked those types of questions. And so I think it's important that we are asking people those questions, even if there isn't obvious signs of abuse, because you never know what's going on. For screening procedures to become functioning, the licensed healthcare practitioner should screen women nearly every routine visit, thus a reason to conduct additional research. So when someone's going in to see maybe their OBGYN, it's important that their OBGYN asks these questions, not in a way to be like probative, but in just a way to check, hey, how are you doing? So I feel like that's super important in this arena. And then sometimes it is crucial when the provider is trying to offer privacy during the examination process because the abusers are usually the ones who brought them to obtain treatment. So this is very important. If the person isn't alone, it's very unlikely that they will tell you the truth. So it's quite valid. And this is proven here that you need to have that going on. And so now we have some tips for domestic violence assessment. So the first tip is the researchers declare that if victims are alone in the room, they're more likely to reveal the abuse as I stated earlier. This is just tip number one, you should always do this. It should be a provider uh, patient relationship. There shouldn't have to be another person there, especially because you never know if that's the one who's abusing them. Our second tip, is to improve and sustain normal relations with numerous agencies and associations. The goal is to educate the community about barriers to screen for domestic violence. So this is a multidisciplinary approach. It just can't be the healthcare providers asking questions that are not doing anything with that information. You need to have teams in place to work with the healthcare providers to give people the treatment they deserve. And our third tip is that we have to do administrative modifications, procedures, and alterations to standardize medical records that supported screening for domestic violence and increased identifying victims. So making sure you have the infrastructure in place to do it. And so consulting with uh, victims of domestic violence, with doctors who have screened for it is super critical with that. And I will pass uh, this off to Dr. Daryl uh, Burrell uh, from here. Thank you, uh, Grace. Next, we will have uh, Dr. Daryl Burrell. He's an associate professor in the Gilling School of Global Public Health at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and a doctoral level assistant professor at Marymount University. Um, He's also a remote visiting scholar at the Samuel Dewitt Proctor Institute for Leadership, Equity, and Justice at Rogers University. Dr. Burrell is a certified diversity professional and a certified executive coach. He has two doctorate degrees and five graduate degrees. And now I'll pass the floor to Dr. Daryl Burrell. Thank you very much for the introduction and Grace, thank you for setting the stage for us to really have a very comprehensive uh, conversation on this issue. So one of the things that I think is real important for people to understand is the nature of how this kind of manifests itself, right? So, you know, when you start talking about domestic violence, it has a variety of contexts under which, you know, people can leverage power and control over someone they're in a relationship with from using coercion and threats, using intimidation, emotional abuse, using isolation, minimizing, denying, blaming, using children. There's a concept called male privilege. We're treating a female like a servant, making all the big decisions, asking like acting like the master of the castle, being the one who defines men and women roles and using economic abuse, preventing a female from getting or keeping a job, 
making her ask for money, giving her allowance, taking her money, not letting her have access to money and family income. So there's some comprehensive dynamics around this whole problem that we need to understand. Grace, can you go to the next slide, please? So some of the gaps that we want to talk about, before I really get into those, one of the things that I really want to talk about is there are some cultural things that we really need to understand about this whole dynamic. And so when we say it's a public health issue, one of the things that we want to let you understand is in a large part, we're talking about people in the medical field screening, but the real issue we really want people to get from our presentation is we really need to have a whole systems approach as to how we address this issue and how we keep people safe and how we minimize this occurrence. And what we mean by whole system approach is yes, we have to educate practitioners that are treating people on the health end, on the on the health side, but we also need to educate people in our general society. We also need to educate law enforcement, and we also need to educate educators in our public school system. Now, obviously we're not trying to dictate what should be taught in school, but just like we're teaching human development and classes are engaging people on areas like sex education, maybe we should start teaching these concepts about what healthy relationships look like, what unhealthy relationships uh, manifest itself and how they look um, in society. And so one of the things uh, we talked about gaps and before 2004, there's a shortage of literature that addressed domestic violence screening tools. Along with that talks about the importance of educating people in all areas about the nature, the prevalence of domestic violence. Grace made a very profound point earlier in her presentation when she talked about the need for people to really understand I'm in an abusive relationship. A lot of times we have these long contexts to think, oh, if someone's not punching me in the face and I have a black eye, I might not be in an abusive relationship, but realize there are subtle things, which I explained earlier, that can lead to, uh, that, that demonstrate or manifest itself as domestic violence. Uh, number two, during early, earlier screening detection efforts to evaluate domestic violence, they use simple tool, conflict tactic scale, um, number three, one of the things is um, we're not using universal screening out there. And so there are some things that, that that scale did that really didn't address all the nuances of domestic violence. Next slide. So screening. So when we talk about screening, it's a uni universal process of screening, assessment of patients, regardless of their reason of seeking medical attention. So just like when you go and you sit down with a doctor and they're asking you certain things around your health or they're asking your health history, you can include this as part of that process to not be an invasive thing. Like one of the things we don't want it to be is, hey, are you in a situation that's risky or forcing yourself on someone just maybe subtle having a conversation with people and, 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 and having those discussions, just like you're screening about family history on this, or what's your experience on that, or what's going on with that. And it could be context of when people are having their annual physical or any time when you're interacting with the doctor. One of the things that we're trying to advocate, right, is a healthcare system that looks at a variety of things um, from, a, from a whole systems perspective, right? And when you start to think about public health, one of the real things about public health is on one side, there's a prevention side. So that prevention side has a health education piece. It has a knowledge piece where you're teaching people on a variety of different areas that touch other people. These are these dynamics, right? So when you start to think about things like COVID, right? One of the things about COVID was we weren't just educating healthcare professionals. We were also educating people. And so when you start to think about moving from a prevention standpoint, that education piece is important. And then the second part is an intervention. So, you know, if I have education on one end, if I have, I'm knowledgeable about it, once it begins, then I know where to go. I know what it looks like. Maybe I can stop it early on before it escalates. You know, the example I try to give when we talk about screening and prevention is if you think about your car, right? If you just drive your car and all you do is put gas in it, you don't do routine maintenance, right? 
chances are when something happens to your car, it's a lot more severe because you haven't been engaged in prevention, right? And so we talk about the intervention piece. So once we realize that someone is in a dynamic, law enforcement professionals and healthcare professionals need to understand the dynamic so that there's a proper intervention there. Because one of the big issues, and it was a question in the group is, you know, a lot of people are reluctant to report it because they don't feel that the outcome will be positive because they don't feel that the people that they may be reporting it to may support them, believe them, or be advocate. And that's part of the education piece. If everyone is educated on, okay, here's where I can go to get support. And if the people you're reporting it to, either in the medical facility or law enforcement community, understand the dynamics around it, then I think people would feel more comfortable and secure about moving forward to report it. But if we don't have that education piece, if we haven't touched the whole system, we're educating victims, we're educating law enforcement, we're educating healthcare professionals, then yeah, there's a reluctance involved. And so one of the things that I talked about when it comes to a lot of times in male and female relationships is that financial abuse. So remember I mentioned earlier where you have some dynamics in relationships where you know, a person doesn't give, allow a person to get a job or have access to money, then that creates another layer that could be a chilling effect over if I report it because they're like, financially, I'm relying on this person to take care of all the bills. I don't work, I'm at home. So now once I report it, what does that do to our family, right? I don't have any way to make, uh, to have an income. And if this person gets locked up in jail, they're the only one working and they're taking care of us. So all these dynamics come to place, which make us realize that this is really a, 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 a big whole systems issue. And one of the things we talk about, um, you can go to the next slide, Grace. So, you know, one of the things we talk about is inquiry initial response. So we, the reason why we talk about healthcare so much is that healthcare person provides a system of intervention, right? That might be a little bit different than, you know, a law enforcement thing, right? If something happens, I call the police, then of course the law enforcement there person comes. But if I'm going to the hospital, right, I might be going to the hospital emergency room or urgent care to be treated for an injury, so that's not really me being proactive saying, hey, I'm in this situation, this is what's happening. So what we, what we, the reason why we think it's important is it creates an opportunity for an intervention for someone to screen and figure out or, or engage someone that might be in a situation where they're in domestic violence. And so that's why we talk about the screening and the healthcare thing, because people are going to receive medical attention, there's an opportunity to engage people where it's a lot different, where police are not knocking on your door saying, hey, are you involved in domestic violence? Usually police get involved when you call them and then they come to respond to some incident. So we look at it as a touch point where you're interacting with people and you have an ability to maybe talk to them, engage them or figure out um, that they're in a specific situation. Next slide. So one of the things we talk about is intimate partner violence and some of the things that occur. Um, and, and to really engage this work, you have to be kind of culturally competent because some ways domestic violence and intimate partner violence has different dynamics based on culture um, and background. And so when we start to talk about health equity and we start to train practitioners on diversity and inclusion, uh, we also need to train practitioners around equity and health literacy around certain cultures and communities. And this is not about advancing stereotypes. This is really about helping people understand the dynamics that take place based on some cultural factors. So if you let, let's take, for example, there's there's research on abuse in Native American and Alaska Native American um, communities. And so one of the things that is culturally that comes out of that research is where they're using cultural customs and traditional beliefs to exert power and control over people. 
right? Where certain cultures will have specific roles where a male is this and a woman might be subservient to a woman on that, right? And so one of the things that occurs culturally in the research is it talks about manipulation where you're using children or you're making someone feel guilty about parenting or you know a variety of things around that where financial abuse could be prevalent um, or there's even dynamics where you're using um, history and cultural things to say historically you should be like this and culturally you should be that like that. Or if you're not that way, then that goes against our culture and our customs, right? Um, abuse in LGBTQ communities has some different dynamics that you need to understand. Some fear about isolation, fear about telling others or, 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 or making person feel guilty or shame and embarrassment around their sense of identity saying I'm going to share this where maybe people might not be aware of, of their lifestyle or their sense of identity. Um, fear of not receiving services. So when you're calling police or you're interacting with people um, as a relation of domestic abuse because they might not have a respect for you and how you're living or an understanding about you and your sense of identity, there's a fear of that. So when I go and engage people in an environment, I'm not treated with dignity and respect. And so all of these things come to play when you're talking about how we're educating people and how we're treating people in a variety of spectrums on domestic violence and intimate partner violence. Next slide. So one of the things that um, we talk about is some best practices around how it can occur. And some of the things we speak about is when people are being treated, you know, having conversations with them. But a lot of uh, doctors are really helping people um, in terms of communication pieces around a variety of health issues. So I know my doctor uses a system called Constant Contact. So Constant Contact is when you keep people's emails together and maybe every month or every quarter, you're sending someone a health literacy or health education piece around a certain health condition, right? Well, you can include information on domestic violence as some of your routine communication that you're sending. When we talk about screening, it could be conducted routinely, um, regardless to if you're coming and you look like you've been beat up or not. Um, it could be conducted orally as face-to-face encounter, or you could be sending questionnaires to people. The whole intent is not to be judgmental, use language that respects someone's background or culture. Um, it should be conducted in private, right? Where you're meeting people, you know, and talking to them alone, not talking to them in front of their children or maybe not talking to them with a the person that brought them there that could be the person that they may need to talk about, right? And it should be confidential and it should be assisted. So if there's language barriers or things related to that, you wanna have interpreter services available to help people. Next slide. So one of the things is that's critical is you need to create a supportive environment where the patient can discuss the abuse and, and, and be comfortable with it. Um, and, and really one of the things that Grace pointed out very profoundly in her early presentation was the whole part about sympathy and empathy. Part of the education, right, piece is engaging people and showing a level of care. I know for me, when I go to the doctor, if I really feel that the doctor really cares about me and my well-being, then guess what? I'm going to feel more comfortable interacting with that doctor. I'm also going to feel more comfortable telling the doctor what's wrong with me or what's happening with me, right? Um, one of the things that's real critical is to gather information about health problems associated with abuse. Grace talked about that. Um, and then assess the long-term health and safety needs of the patient in order to develop and implement a response. So one of the things as part of the education piece should be safety planning around this. So not just explaining what abuse is, explaining where people can go, then explaining 
how people can do some level of safety planning if they're in a relationship with an intimate partner or domestic partner that's abusive. The real thing the assessment should allow people to do is a pa patient should disclose current and, and former abuse, and it should as a minimum, next slide. Let people understand, are you in danger? Is your partner at the health facility now, right? Do you wanna go home with your partner? Is there somewhere else safe you have to go? Have there been direct threats and abuse for children? Because a lot of things that we really did not highlight is there's a lot of research out there that says if the parent is being abused, there could also be abuse with the children. And so there's this other dynamic that a lot of times people are afraid, well, if I leave, you know, what will happen to my children? Or a lot of times there's a dynamic where I'm I'm putting myself in harm's way to keep my children from being abused in some perspective right? One of the things is asking, are you afraid that your life might be in danger? Has the violence gotten worse? Has your partner used weapons, drugs, or alcohol? Has your partner held you or your children against your will? Does your partner watch you closely, follow you, stalk you? Has your partner ever threatened to kill you, himself, or your children? So these are some common screening. And the assessment should really cover a pattern in history of current abuse. Next slide. How long has the violence been going on? Have you ever been hospitalized because of abuse? Can you tell me about your most serious event? Has your partner forced you to have sex, hurt you sexually, or forced you into sexual acts that made you feel uncomfortable? Has family members or children or pets been hurt? Does your partner control your activities, money, or children? Next slide. So for the patient, right? There's some elements and questions around past history, right? You still feel at risk. When did it occur, right? Are you in contact with your partner? Um, you know, and then there's training. What if the patient says no? What do you kind of do? You know, and, and really the whole skill is the interviewing process. Um, and, and health practitioners really need to be trained that this isn't just, hey, fill out this form and give it back to me that a lot of times these things are very painful. There's an anguish, there's a level of shame, there's a level of guilt, there's a level of anxiety. And that's why really training healthcare professionals to practice that empathy and sympathy and know how to engage these situations in the right way is really, really critical part of this process. Next slide. So one of the things that's important is to provide information, right? So as I mentioned before, we really need to start helping people understand what this is. Grace talked earlier about a lot of people not even understanding that they're in a relationship that represents a level of domestic violence. And that's why we need to start training people when we're having those classes in human development where we're teaching sex education, we also need to teach about domestic violence and healthy relationships. And it's not about putting judgments on, this is my judgment of what a healthy relationship looks like, but it's helping people understand the clues and the dynamics that could occur to help you recognize if you're in, an, in, a, in, a, in a relationship where power and control is being used, where there's a level of violence or intimidation that you should be aware of. Because if you can recognize it and understand it early, right? then you can either get out of the relationship or you know what to do to try to address it and minimize it. Um, move, move back a little bit. So one of the things is to really help people understand that it happens in all kinds of relationships. And as I gave my analogy for about your car and car maintenance, right? If you don't address it early on, as it escalates, it can perpetually be worse and it can impact your health in many ways. You know, one of the things that COVID taught us all is about the dynamics of mental health, right? And the aspects of isolation and withdrawal and loneliness can do on our mental capacity. So think about if you're in a relationship with someone you truly care about and you love, and they're intentionally creating these dynamics on you over time, these can, hurt you mentally 
And it's not just physical abuse with hitting or punching or beating someone up. There are some other dynamics that should be addressed and um, should be areas of concern. The other thing is providing information that you're not to blame, right? Guilt and shame often follows people, right? You know, it was my fault. You know, that was the reason why I didn't do something right. And there's these, all these mental dynamics that are around co co coercion, power and control that are aspects of domestic violence. Next slide. So one of the things is real important is to help people understand the safety issues and help people develop safety planning and understanding of what safety planning looks like. Like Grace and I could mention safety planning and you could nod your head like you know what it is. But if we really get down saying, yeah, I understand what safety planning is, but there's a difference between understanding what you mean by the term with knowing actually what should I do and what does it look like and how should it function? Next slide. And so it's really important to, for people to have information and knowledge to help patients know where to go and, you know, how to engage things, right? And put themselves in an environment where they can be safe. Um, one of the things is um, to let people know, hey, these are hotlines or here's law enforcement, they can do this. You know, a lot of progressive law enforcement agencies are actually creating domestic violence units in their police force, which are properly trained police officers that when a domestic violence issue occurs, they know how to engage the process, they know the dynamics, and they don't just intervene to say, let's lock the person up, but they also have information on support systems where the victim can go can, and get help after the police leave and, and engage in whatever intervention they're engaging in. Next slide. So one of the things that's important why I talk about this being a whole system is, you know, medical professionals, law enforcement professionals, and domestic violence advocacy groups all need to work together and all need to be connected, right? When people say it takes a village to raise someone, right? This is really the, the reason why we talk about this as a public health issue, because in order for us to address public health issues, we need a variety of different people from different backgrounds and different perspectives in order to address it. If you think about COVID and how we address COVID-19, it wasn't just doctors, right? We needed people from all backgrounds and fields that were touched by it to get involved. And so the education piece doesn't just need to happen at medical practice, but it needs to happen, you know, for everyone that's engaged in this process. Next slide. The real thing important is confidentiality, where if someone is reporting things to the health professional, right, understanding and respecting person's privacy and confidentiality um, along the process. So this is real important because if things are not held confident, it could be a safety risk to the person that's a victim. Or maybe they're talking to the healthcare provider and they want some time to work on a safety plan, but if it's not kept confidential, you could keep put them in risk before they could develop that safety plan. So confidentiality is real important. Next slide. And documentation is also critical. So when you have documentation over time, right? Um, then obviously if it escalates to the point that law enforcement gets involved and prosecutors get involved. So one of the things is teaching, not just medical professionals about documentation, but teaching individuals. If you think that you're in an abusive relationship, you know, one of the things you might wanna do is keep a journal and log. And maybe if you see things escalating, you can have that information. So now when you're talking to law enforcement or you're talking to a prosecutor, you have a documentation of these when these events occurred, these are the nature of these events. And again, that all starts with the education piece. If I don't understand the dynamics and various aspects of domestic violence, then I don't really understand what's happening to me. And maybe I won't understand until it's too late. And so having that documentation is very, very important. 
not just for you as a victim, but also in healthcare facilities where they're talking to someone about it and they're able to document, hey, their eye was black or their arm was broken or the shirt was ripped or these other dynamics to keep that as part of their medical records as they move forward. Next slide. Um, the whole thing is to talk about um, physical examination, right? So it's real critical if someone says they're part of a domestic violence situation, they might be getting treated for one thing, but a lot of times it's standard practice maybe to give someone a physical because maybe there are other injuries that maybe could come out of a physical exam versus I'm being treated because I have a busted lip or I have a black eye. There could be other dynamics. So a physical examination is a critical part of that screening, not just asking what's happening and you sharing the dynamics of the relationship, but making sure and checking your health. And another aspect of that physical examination could be following up with counseling service, connecting with people that can help with mental health, counseling psychology to assist after those physical ailments to assist with those mental ailments. Next slide. So at this time, um, my, my colleague, Dr. Huff, our colleague is not here today. She's actually traveling to Panama. I talked to her in the airport. She wished me and Grace luck with our presentation, but um, what we'd like to do is take questions at this point. And you can stop sharing the slides, Grace. Thank you, Dr. Burrell. Uh, we have a couple of questions. The first one, um, do you see any downsides to mandatory reporting of abuse by healthcare providers to authorities? I do, because again, um, I think you need to respect someone's confidentiality. That's when the confidentiality piece comes because again, when you start to look at the, the process, mandatory reporting doesn't allow me if, as a victim, if I've decided I wanna leave this relationship, maybe time that I need to create a safety plan to get out. So if immediately I come to you, you mandatory report it and then someone shows up, now what you could do is put me at risk or put me in risk of harm because I'm not really prepared to do anything about it at that time. To follow up with that as well, especially if the person that is hurting them is well connected and they're well connected with the police department, that's only going to make them more of a target. And so you also have to keep in mind like who they're connected to and who the abuser is connected to. So I feel like adding more consent to the process, adding more victim input is what's needed within reporting and how to best serve the victim because the victim knows what they need. And it's not you, you're not there declaring what they need. They know what they need. I suppose it's putting some agency back on the victim to really uh, creating the circumstances to encourage them to move forward with denouncing if they feel like so doing. It's all about giving the control back, especially with like physical examinations, like asking for consent, as Daryl said before, like taking photos, like giving them that power that's been taken away from them is very important. So you don't wanna go in there and declare, hey, I'm gonna do this and you have no say over it because it's only repeating the cycle of abuse they've been in. That's a very, very good point. Um, the second question, are there any examples in countries older than the US that we can learn from in terms of managing domestic violence as both public health and criminal issues? So I would say no. <laughs> and part of the problem is, this is really not just a US his issue, it's a global health issue that we have to start talking about. And the problem with it is we're looking at it too piecemeal when we need to have a systems approach on it because there are different elements of it that tend to fail abusers, right? So there's one element where I'm going to the medical provider, medical provider's not screening, but there's another element where law enforcement has a chance to intervene. You know, a lot of people are talking about the Gabby Petito case, right? Where her boyfriend killed her. Well, there was an intervention where police came along and they were fighting 
And police had an opportunity to recognize that this was a situation that was escalating, but the police just let him leave. And then eventually she was killed by the guy. And so if those police had a really been educated on domestic violence and what's worse was they had a policy in place where they're supposed to separate them. Someone had to be arrested, one or the other, and they didn't do it. So when as, as an end result, the guy ended up killing the girl. Now the family now is suing the police for like 50 million. I just saw it on the news today saying that the police failed their daughter because there was an incident where, and Grace and I talk about critical touch points where you're meeting people and you're having an opportunity to intervene and the intervention either doesn't occur, it doesn't happen properly. And what it does is it creates a worse dynamic, right? Because there was an opportunity that could have helped the person that didn't take place. And so I think globally, we have to have more discussions about how we deal with it on the health side, how we educate people from the time that they start dating about domestic violence, how we train law enforcement people to be able to intervene in a way it's fair and equitable. And then how we create social safety nets. So if I am a female that doesn't work, am I in a homeless shelter, right? With my kids, where a lot of people are having to make a decision. Okay, I need to stay in this environment because my kids are small and he's the only person working. And if we leave him, yeah, I won't get beat up, but my kids will be hungry. And so until we can touch all those different dynamics, right, then we're not ready to address it. So I would just say a lot of country, there's there's really no country i found that's doing a good job around these dynamics. And to follow up on that, it was presented earlier too, the data shows that it's almost every country has an issue and how like domestic violence has risen within COVID-19, uh, the pandemic area. So I think it's definitely a global problem. It's also a cultural issue too, because it, us in the U.S. may view other cultures and how they treat maybe women, for example, in a way that could be, we, we deem as violent, but in that culture, it's not violent, right? So there's also a lot of cultural barriers that exist too, where we have a belief one way, they have a belief the other way. So this sort of relates to a uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goal about gender equality. So I feel like that plays a big role too, because gender does play a role in this. Even men are victims as well, but with women being victims, sometimes they're not believed in certain cultures, especially when there isn't gender equality that exists. Thank you. I think that a, a common thread in this conversation has been the need for education at all levels, really, beginning at home, at school, in police departments, from the government, for, from nonprofit organizations, and, and the need to continue raising awareness, really, about this issue. I mean, in the same way that in the last years or decades, we've raised awareness about other issues, climate change, LGBTQ issues, uh, uh, gender equality, etc. But unfortunately, domestic violence, it seems that it's not something that we have pushed enough. And it seems that it really all starts with that aspect of awareness and education at all levels of society, really. Yes. Um, there are no more questions, so we'll go ahead and end this session. Thank you, Grace. Uh, thank you, Daryl. And thank you to the audience. We hope to see you in our next sessions. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.